age 32, Matahari's celeb joyride is slowing down. She signs on to perform with the Paris Opera, quarrels with the dance mistress, and gets the hook for being fat. There were competitors in this world, not just rather upscale figures, but others who were performing in rather more tawdry ways, who were more or less strippers. So the audience becomes fractured, and she finds herself performing in some rather ropey venues. She's booked into a music hall in uh, Palermo, where she's on the bill with a dancing dog act. Then a lifeline, $220,000 for a six-month gig at the famous Metropole Theatre in Berlin. But the timing couldn't be worse. It's August 1914 and the war breaks out. The bank freezes her accounts, her German agent refuses to pay her, and her costumier seizes her jewellery and furs for unpaid debts. And so Matahari is left kind of penniless in Berlin. But she soon spots her next opportunity. A German diplomat offers her $60,000 to go to Paris as a German agent. He must know that she's intimate with military men. He must know that the pillow talk is probably part of the business of her life. And he sees in this an opportunity to extract information for Germany. And she takes the bait. Matahari's new persona, spy. 1916. Matahari's back in town with a bag full of German money, her bejeweled bra, and her address book. The Germans paid her a small fortune and even gave her a bottle of invisible ink to spy on the French. But she thinks she's owed that money and has no intention of spying on anyone. She thought it was like performing, you know, a dance, that it was something that she could make up the rules as she went along. She thinks it's business as usual, but because of the war, the freewheeling fun times are over. Paris is a city at war. The rumble of the artillery can be heard in the city, but she doesn't quite realize how serious the situation is. And it's this ignorance that's going to be her downfall. The French police are very suspicious. They now watch her every move. What they produce is a list of posh shops, tea houses, uh, places of pleasure that she's taken herself to during the day. What they don't find is any evidence of any espionage activity. One undercover cop dresses up as a valet and ransacks her hotel suite. They come up with an impressive list of her current lovers. An officer from Montenegro, an Italian captain, a French lieutenant, two Irish officers, a Belgian general, but no spy stuff. Lots of glitzy underwear, but not a whiff of any state secrets. Even though they followed her for more than a year, they found absolutely no evidence of her spying whatsoever. Sahari went to German spy school, was codenamed Agent H21, and learned the dark arts of espionage, the signals for message drops, the do's and don'ts of invisible ink. There's absolutely no evidence she was actually at any such spy school in Belgium, but that was a, a prevalent mythology at the time and still lingers today. It's probably false. But Matahari's love life is on the record. When she gets to Paris, she meets a young Russian officer at um, a private salon, Vadim de Maslov, and she falls madly in love, and this changes everything for her. She needs a travel pass to visit him at the front, but Georges Ladoux, head of French counter-espionage, wants something in return. So Georges Ladoux says to her, if you could get to Belgium and fraternize with the German high command, that would be extremely valuable to us. And Matahari says, yeah, I can do that, being Matahari. Matahari has reinvented herself yet again. Now she's a double agent. Well, I do believe that uh, a sexual liaison could be a, a spy's greatest weapon. This is why he was so interested in Matahari. She seduces the German consul in Madrid and weasels some tidbits of information out of him for Ledoux. Now, where did she put that invisible ink? The Germans really did use invisible ink in World War I. Some say that they even gave it to Matahari to use. Here's an actual formula. 
This is from July 1918. That's what the Germans used for secret ink. It's a long list of ingredients. It comes to actually passing on the purloined information. Matahari is more Mr. Bean than 007. No secret mail drops for her. She puts it in an envelope, addresses it to Ladoux in Paris, and sends it off in the regular mail like a letter to Grandma. That letter would have been read by the hotel censor, so she'd completely blown her cover. She's kind of innocent, naive, maybe a little dumb, uh, and desperate. I think that she had very little idea about the dark forces that were massing around her. There was no escape for her here. Paris, 1917. In her suite at the Elysee Palace Hotel, Matahari finds her own solution to the food shortage in war-ravaged France. She calls room service. But along with the croissant comes a nasty surprise. It's the police, and they've come to take her to prison. She's tossed into the notorious Salazar prison, where the room service isn't nearly as good. Matari describes the food as being so bad that even the prison dog wouldn't eat it. Arrested for spying, her dramatic come down is the talk of France. This would be like the equivalent of putting Madonna in Guantanamo Bay. But she's hung out to dry. They all turn their backs on her, pretend that they haven't given her money, pretended that they hadn't really had any kind of relationship with her. She still clung to the idea that she'd be freed in the end, that somehow the, the mystique of Matahari...